Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at aerodynamic forces. We're going to be taking pressure and shear stress and deriving the forces of lift and drag from them. So the way we get there is by looking at a given surface. The surface we're going to be looking at is just going to be a cylindrical shell that is sitting on the ground. And this shell is going to have some airflow going over it. We're going to have pressure both on the outside and the inside. So I'm going to draw pressure pushing down from the outside and pushing back out from the inside. In addition, we can have some shear stress that's caused by the friction of the air moving over this surface. So we need a little bit more information to move forward. What we're going to be saying is that the pressure inside this vessel is P infinity, which is also the static pressure of the air outside. Additionally, we're going to be saying that this air outside is moving at a velocity U infinity. And we're going to be using Bernoulli's equation, which says that the pressure plus one half times rho U squared is equal to a constant. So first, let's use this in order to find the pressure distribution on the outside of our surface here. We're going to make some additional assumptions in order to make all this happen. The next assumption we're going to make is that we have ideal flow. This has a couple of ramifications, the first of which is that tau, our shear stress, is going to be zero since there's no friction in ideal flow. The next is that we actually know exactly what our velocity distribution is over our cylinder. If we define this surface based on an angle theta, we can say that the velocity at a given theta is going to be equal to 2 times the far field velocity times sine of theta. So when theta is equal to 0 or to pi, our velocity is going to be 0. And when it's equal to pi over 2, then it's at its maximum, twice the far field velocity. So with these two pieces, we can actually come up with an equation for the pressure over our entire surface. We're going to write Bernoulli's equation for a given theta value and for the infinity case. This ends up being p of theta plus 1 half rho times u of theta squared is equal to p infinity plus 1 half rho times u infinity squared. And all we need to do is just solve this for p of theta, which just means moving this piece to the right-hand side. p of theta is equal to p infinity plus 1 half rho u infinity squared multiplied by 1 from this piece minus u of theta divided by u infinity squared. u of theta divided by u infinity is exactly equal to 2 times sine of theta. So this piece here is just equal to 4 times sine squared of theta. The next piece is actually taking this pressure that we know and getting a force out of it. The force on a surface is the integral over that surface of the pressure pushing on the areas. That's not quite enough because we actually need a direction to go along with that. So what direction is our pressure pushing in? Well, we can define a normal vector in hat which is pointing outward at every point along this surface. If that's the case, then our pressure is going to be pushing directly against that. So the force that we have is going to be our pressure multiplied by this direction, and we need a negative sign, and that's going to be multiplied by our area. So we have the magnitude, this PDA, multiplied by our direction to get the total force vector from this little piece. So this is in general terms. How do we actually write this for this equation? Well, we're going to have the integral from 0 to pi of the pressure on the outside pushing in. So this is going to be a negative p of theta multiplied by n hat. And then we have a p infinity pushing outward. So this is a plus p infinity multiplied by n hat. And all of that's going to be multiplied by this dA. 
Well, we want to integrate over theta. So instead of dA, we can write this as a width into the page multiplied by r times d theta, where this r is just the radius of our semicircle. Now let's rewrite this a little simpler. We can bring our constants out, and inside we just end up with p infinity minus p of theta, all multiplied by n hat d theta. Now this n hat changes depending on where we are in theta, so we actually need to write this out as a vector. This is going to be equal to a vector of cosine and sine terms. We need to define what our i and j are in order to write a vector in Cartesian coordinates. Let's define i as in line with our flow field, so i is pointing directly to the right, and j is going to be pointing directly upward. In that case, when theta is equal to 0, cosine of theta is equal to 1, and our normal is pointing directly to the right, in line with the i direction. So cosine of theta is the i component of our normal vector. And then the sine component is going to be in the j direction, because when sine of theta is 1, theta is equal to pi over 2. So this is going to be sine of theta. Now we'd like to substitute in this p infinity minus p of theta. So let's go ahead and rearrange this equation down here to make that happen. So p infinity minus p of theta is going to be equal to the negative of this entire side. So we end up with negative 1 half rho u infinity squared multiplied by 1. And then we can substitute in this 4 sine squared theta to end up with 1 minus 4 sine squared theta and we can go ahead and distribute this negative sign. So we end up for our force with w times r times 1 half rho u infinity squared multiplied by this integral from 0 to pi of 4 sine squared theta minus 1 times this n hat d theta. So that's the total force in vector form, but what we'd actually like is to separate this out into lift and drag. So what exactly are lift and drag? Well, drag is the component of this force that is in the exact same direction as our velocity. So what we need to do is we need to take this force, split it up, and grab the component that's only in the direction of velocity. Well, there's a very easy way of doing that, and that's taking the dot product with the direction that we want. So if we take the dot product with i, we're grabbing only the i component of our force. This i doesn't affect anything except for this vector. Now if we take the dot product of i with n, we end up with only the i component of our n term, which is cosine theta. So what does this mean for our drag equation? This becomes 1 half rho u infinity squared times wr multiplied by this integral term, which doesn't change. And that, instead of being multiplied by n hat, is going to be multiplied by cosine of theta. Without going into the math too heavily, the integral from 0 to pi of cosine of theta is equal to 0. So we can set this 1 equal to 0. The integral from 0 to pi of cosine theta multiplied by sine squared theta is also 0. So this entire term goes to 0. There's no drag on this entire cylinder. Well, that should be expected because we're talking about ideal flow. There's nothing there to cause drag. But what about lift? Lift is simply the force component in the j direction. We'll just rewrite this entire thing, but instead of cosine theta, we're going to end up with the j component of n, which is sine theta. Now, if we integrate sine theta from 0 to pi, we end up with 2. If we integrate sine cubed theta from 0 to pi, we end up with 4 thirds. So 4 multiplied by 4 thirds is going to be 16 thirds. If we subtract off 2, we end up with 10 thirds. So long story short, our lift ends up being 5 thirds multiplied by all of our constants. And our drag is equal to 0. So that's how we calculate our lift and drag for this specific case. But how can we generalize this a little bit? Well, instead of looking at a specific surface, let's think of just a generic surface that has some pressure and shear stress on it. 
our pressure is going to cause a force down on our surface and our shear stress is going to be pushing along the surface. Now, as before, I want to write these as infinitesimal vectors of force. The pressure isn't going to change. We're still gonna have a component of force. This time I'm gonna label it as due to pressure and it's gonna be equal to exactly the same as before, negative P times N hat dA. But now we're also gonna consider our shear stress force. So that force we're going to label as the force due to tau, and it's just gonna be equal to tau, and we need to define a new direction here. So it's gonna be tau dA, and our new direction is just going to be along the surface. So we're gonna call this the tangent direction. So our total force is tau dA as a magnitude, and our direction is in the tangent direction. And as before, our normal direction is simply pointing outward from our surface. This is great if all we're interested in doing is defining the force as a vector, because we can just take the integral of both of these pieces, this dFp over the area, and our df tau over the area, and we'd end up with our total force. But if we want to actually separate these out into lift and drag, we need to think a little bit about how we want to parameterize this surface. Rather than dealing with the entire surface, we can just look at this individual piece and think at what angle does this piece of the surface make with the oncoming flow. So if our oncoming flow is pointing directly to the right, then we can define an angle theta to this surface that we have here. So if we do this and then also define i as pointing to the right and j as pointing upward, we can see that we can rewrite our normal and tangent vectors in terms of i and j. Our tangent vector is simply going to be cosine of theta times i, since when theta is equal to zero, the tangent vector is pointing directly in the i direction, plus sine of theta times j. Our normal vector is going to be a negative sine theta times i plus a cosine of theta times j. All right, so let's plug in these values and then split this up based on our new definitions of the tangent and normal vectors. So this is gonna be the integral over our entire area of this negative p in hat plus tau t hat, and all that is over the area dA. Now our lift is going to be the j component of our force vector. So we can just use the j components of our tangent and normal vectors and plug those in as well. So what we end up with is an integral over the entire area of negative p, and then the j component of n is just cosine theta. So we end up with a cosine theta plus our tau multiplied by sine theta, and all that's multiplied by dA. For our drag, we integrate over the area again. This time, we have negative p multiplied by a negative sine theta, so we just have a p times sine of theta, plus our tau multiplied by the i component here, which is cosine of theta, and all that's multiplied by dA. So at each point along our surface, we'd have to determine what angle that surface makes with our oncoming flow and use that in order to figure out what the lift and drag components would be. So this is a slightly more general way to define the lift and drag.